Okay, hi everyone. Welcome uh, again to Sci-Fi. It's uh, Friday, uh, Psychoanalysis Day at Sublation Media. Thanks so much for coming and joining us again today. And it's been great to see all the support and comments uh, for our recent episodes. Really, really appreciate that. And I also want to say that Elliot and I now have a Patreon. Uh, so we do all this for free. So please do consider uh, having a look at the Patreon. I think what we plan to do is... Um, extra extra like a b-side uh, that elliot and i will record uh, so patrons will get like uh, some exclusive content but you'll also just get to feel like you're helping us out so that'd be great and i'll put the link in the in the chat there uh in the comments uh, not the comments what do you call that in the stuff yeah the, yeah the uh, details great. how are you elliot good <laughs> And uh, we're really delighted to be joined uh, today by Patricia Garavici, uh, uh, a practicing psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst in Philadelphia and an author of many, many books, um, including uh, really significantly uh, Transgender Psychoanalysis, uh, which I think, how, how, when did that one come out, uh, uh, Patricia, a few years ago? 2017. 2017, and then more recently than that, uh, Psychoanalysis in the Barrios, uh, which has won a couple of awards and explores uh, race, class, the unconscious, Latin America, global psychoanalysis, and, and so on. That's uh, co-edited with um, Christopher Christian. Uh, and so we're really, really happy to have Patricia here, a very important voice on the on the psychoanalytic in the psychoanalytic world. And we're going to talk about all, all your work in general, and especially these two books. So thanks so much for joining us, Patricia. Great to have you here. No, thank you, Alfie. Thank you, Elio. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very yeah, happy to be I'm here with you today. Right. It's really the books are good. I should I should surprise Elliot. I, I should I should stress that because I mean I was reading the books and I was um you know you're you're learning about like uh hysteria and kind of a deep uh way. That's kind of what kind of stood out to me as I was going through uh, a couple that you sent us, right? Um, in terms of the hysteria of kind of the body, uh, you know, with, you know, the tr with the tr idea of applying psychoanalysis to uh, the transgender body, right? Um, there's this idea that hysteria is, is the linguistic primacy over the body, but that this can be a kind of liberatory, uh, dialectic and there is this kind of tension i think in the transgender uh uh you could say issue or debate if there is a debate or if it's more like people existing and, and people <laughs> antagonizing them i'm not sure if that's a debate uh may i was i was hoping that maybe you could s speak a little bit on that in terms of how does lacan inform uh transgenderism apologies if my like word is not the best but this um, that's the best I can muster. <laughs> that's my limit kant says we need to know limits that's my limit my wording <laughs> so hopefully that's in, in no no objection <laughs> about your wording you, you're talking about hysteria then hysteria is very important for let's say us psychoanalysts because thanks to uh people who, and I'm going back to the beginning of psychoanalysis, who presented symptoms for which the standard knowledge of medicine could give no answers, thanks to something that was mostly expressed through bodily symptoms and happened to occur in people that we could describe as corresponding to a diagnosis of hysteria or a structure of hysteria, I would rather speak. Thanks to that, we not only Freud invented psychoanalysis, but most importantly, discovered the existence of the unconscious. And what is interesting about hysteria, and you were mentioning the barrio, is that it happens to be a form of a, a psychic structure that also functions as a cultural barometer that is uh, eminently political, uh, that hysteria happens if you think of hysteria not uh, just as simply a pathology, but rather as Lacan takes it as a form of social link, is one that would always uh, denounce who is pretending to play the role of the master and, uh, and show the deficiencies of the master with a complicated political plan because 
hysterics would denounce, detect, denounce, and demote the master. But then, as Lacan said in 68 to the students rebelling in, in May of 68, he said, you will go and look it for a new master. The, the political project of hysteria is complicated because it has this tendency of finding a master, but always needing a master. So we could talk about that. But in terms of the clinic, what uh, for me was an amazing discovery was to see that hysteria could still be revitalized in psychoanalysis in the same way that help Freud invented it. Today, it continues to challenge the clinical practice and also uh, guide. And when you were mentioning the trans experience, is thanks to trans-identified analysis that in my own clinical practice, I was uh, forced to revise issues concerning gender and sexuality, but most important things that we may call ontological, because it relates to the very being of those mm, analysis. And, and by ontologic, I, I simply mean people who, if it's something I hear a lot in my practice, uh, if I would not have transitioned, I would have killed myself, I would have committed suicide. So this points to issues of uh, existence, and then we may call them ontological, that force us also to revise uh, notions of uh, the at least the Freudian and Lacanian metapsychology, and it focus a lot on the death drive. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was going to ask something else first, but I think I'll, I'll just go to this, because one of the things, I mean, I really, really found um, interesting in your, in your book on transgender psychoanalysis is the question of universality. I think it's around chapters 11 and 12 that you kind of explore this. And I think if I've understood this right, um, you're, 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 you're saying that, or you're arguing that, as you've just finished by saying, I think that, you know, our ideas that when you, when you look at the, the, the situation with, with, of, of transgender or, or the analyzants who are transgender, it forces you to create a new concept of gender and sexuality. So this and this concept applies universally, not just to <laughs> those transgender identifying individuals, but the, the fact of transgender identifying individuals produces a new concept of sexuality, which is universal, right, which applies to, to all. I, I find that really interesting. And I would wonder if you could sort of um, just explain or explore that a little bit. And it also as a kind of question, it made me wonder whether we're getting it wrong by thinking of because this this universality is really appealing to me because in that sense we're all in this together whereas mm -hmm. a lot of the discourses mm -hmm. you know trans people are x and uh, and they are identified as trans and the rest of us are not so there's this kind of binary between the trans and non-trans mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. that it seems prominent in the discourse are you sort of are you are you saying that this is the wrong way of of thinking about it and in fact we do all share uh, in the in the kinds of sexuality that emerge from this discussion and so on. Yes, there is this, uh, I think, interesting issue when Elliot was mentioning the body through different forms of mm, human suffering expressed through the body. What I discovered by listening to analysis who identify as trans, that there was something about uh, the way the body was experienced in the trans uh, experience that led me to uh, reflect upon issues that we could generalize. Uh, I think this is the interesting thing of psychoanalysis and also a challenging feature of psychoanalysis that we always work case by case. Each case is unique, is singular, is untranslatable if an analysis took place in one specific language, can, we cannot translate what happened onto a line. And it's untranslatable in the sense that the, the elements often are very close to, to the language in which uh, that analysis was conducted. And at the same time, so we have this very exceptional quality of psychoanalytic practice. We have a tendency to the universal. So, and it, it, there is always this tension in psychoanalysis, uh, giving priority to each singular subject. And that's, I find very important also politically. That was my experience working in the barrio with uh, 
people who are often treated like objects and not like subjects and are often approached with pedagogical strategies. It was extremely important, and there is where you see the emancipatory potential of psychoanalysis, when you give to the subjects unique uh, in, in experience that cannot be duplicated. I'm thinking of often the model of hard science is the idea that you could repeat the same experiment as long as you have the same conditions, the same results will be obtain uh, psychoanalysis is we, we cannot repeat the psychoanalysis the same results will not be obtained so it's, a, it's more on the side of the contingency but nevertheless we have structural issues and we have universal issues and uh, about the bodily experience what I learned uh, I think the, the, the fact that a person can move from one gender to another or that they feel that the gender the way assigned at birth doesn't align with the gender they identify with tells you that the materiality of the body is not given that in order to assume our bodily existence something has to happen and i think it's betrayed by the use in english of uh, the verb we don't say I am a body, we say, I have a body. And there is this tension, I was saying, ontological issues, uh, gender transition, and this is what I learned in the practice, is an issue about being, not about having. And in that way, we take distance from uh, many controversial issues uh, about in psychoanalysis, about the Oedipal plot, the primacy of the phallus, and so on and so forth. And we could maybe... Uh, discover also in the exceptionality of each person uh, something structural about the fact that we are born into a body that is mortal, that uh, will assume a gender in order to exist, even if that gender may not fit in the binary. That's a one uh, thing that happens to take place in the society we live in now, it may change, but right now, and that was something already observed by Freud early on, when we ran into the stranger on the street, the first assumption we make is male, female. And, and this happens to still be the case. So in order to exist in society, you need to assume a gender, a gendered identity. And, and these issues are uh, issues that trans and cis people confront, that in a way we could talk about, as you were saying, Alfie, universal uh, concerns or universal challenges. Yeah. How, and yes. So, so how do we organize the other? You know, it sounds like there's this question of um, mm -hmm. our initial impulses to see the other as man or, or woman. It seem, and the, these kind of structures help us organize uh, reality. Maybe maybe we can talk a bit about the bar. Sorry, Alfie, I'm like kind of stepping on you a little bit, but feel free. But maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the, the kind of Barrio book and the kind of structuralism uh, that you bring up in the Barrio book in terms of there's this kind of intense structuralism of the ghetto and you also talk about the Jewish ghetto and there's this kind of oppressive uh, tendency of structure. My impression of Freud has always kind of been that he is a defender of kind of societal structures in, in a certain way versus I, I, I feel like there are, there are tendencies in Deleuze or even tendencies, mm -hmm. which I don't think are good, and like Jung uh, always to kind of dis, like uh, disregard kind of uh, societal structures and, and for, the, for the particular individual. Is Freud, a kind of, like how, how does Freud say that we should encounter the other or maybe Lacan or, or maybe uh, your informed practice with different kind of theories? How, how should I encounter the other if not with my immediate intuition? Yeah, well, I think it would be difficult to think of a, uh, of Freud as a structuralist avant la lettre, but nevertheless, he gives primacy to the other without disregarding the alienating function. He talks that uh, at the beginning, there is uh, we, we are born in the humans, we start life in a state of total helplessness, 
and uh, and the human offspring requires the presence of another to survive. Uh, other mammals are better off, whereas the human offspring needs not just someone taking care of basic needs, food, and uh, and taking care of uh, this very defenseless uh, creature, but also that one needs to be desire in order to exist as a subject. And, and Freud it says that this paradox, that this first other is at the same time the, the first uh, object of, of love and also the first object of hate. But also he mentions, and that says something if uh, for those interested in rereading it, from Freud directly, which I strongly recommend. He's always very illuminating and a very generous writer that every time you read the text by Freud, there is always the possibility of learning something new. And um, what he says there is that in this basic helplessness in the project for a, a psychology, for neurology, is a text from 1895. Very old text, but very illuminating because he says that this extreme dependence is the basic of moral and ethics, and ethics of the other. That this extreme dependence of on another is the basis for moral feelings. So that there is a, a function in terms of how Freud thinks of narcissism and how the ego is developed is always in identification with another that is exterior and is tasked with giving us a sense of a most intimate sense of selflessness, of the cells, the, the sense of self comes from the outside. On the other hand, this alienation in the other could be the beginning of an ethics of the other. So I don't know if I would say structural. I don't think Freud... Uh, my impression is in most cases Freud, rather than being um, a promoter, is more of an explicator. He may talk about, if you think of totem and taboo, uh, he uses a very myth and a total false anthropological uh, and, and construction to explain how the society is organized. Does not need that he necessarily uh, supports it as an ideal model. Freud was very aware and, right. and, and always very pessimistic about human nature. If you think of discontent, uh, civilization and discontent, he always was aware of how, how aggressive humans are, how ready we are to, to kill the neighbor and detest that we are prone to hate. And he was not naive, but at the same time, he mm, was uh, able to be a keen observer. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's, just, that's really interesting. I mean, I just want to go back a little bit. I mean, I think I'm just yes. a bit slower uh, <laughs> in my thinking than uh, the, the, I wanted to talk more about the connection between trans and hysteria that we were on before mm -hmm. um, and ask you a little bit more about this. I mean, so I, I really, really thought there was as one of the things I thought was just absolutely ingenious in, in your book was this part about the two mistakes in Freud like almost in this kind of Hegelian way where, you know, the mistake or the failure, like it's what produces the knowledge in the first place. And this is a great, and you, you talk about these two mistakes. And one of them uh, is uh, the use of the term hysteria in a context where um, hysteria was associated with the uterus and so on. So Freud kind of makes the mistake of, the, the so-called mistake of um, uh, saying that a man, uh, including himself, could be hysteric and he diagnoses a case of hysteria in a man. And, you know, in, in your words, uh, this is Freud queering the concept of hysteria mm -hmm. and not making it gender dependent, which is goes back to what you were you were saying a moment ago about how we instinctively uh you know start with the gender when um diagnosing the other or interpreting the other so i think i think uh, it'd be really worth i mean i think this is really interesting and and the second mistake that you talk about in freud's work is um the castration issue right mm -hmm. that, uh, again um you know and and uh, while for freud maybe we can say that uh ca castration is uh something that women have suffered and men fear suffering you then are obviously adding the lacanian like reversal of this where you know uh the phallus is not an organ but something nobody has or can be right so mm -hmm. you talk about kind of two mistakes in freud 
um, uh, which are to do with castration and to do with hysteria. Both of these connect to the transgender experience, mm -hmm. right? Um, so could you like speak about how, you know, these two critical um, aspects of Freudian thinking or psycho Lacanian psychoanalytic thinking lead you to a diag a, 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 what is not a diagnosis, a, 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 a theory that is based in emerging from transgender issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, in a way, I was quite familiarized with hysteria precisely from the barrio. And uh, what I discovered working in the barrio in North Philadelphia in this uh, community that is uh, segregated by the language they speak and in a very precise location, that I heard for the first time ever something called the Puerto Rican syndrome. And I was very shocked because I have no idea what it was. And when I look at the literature, I discovered that it was a, a diagnosis invented uh, around 1950s in the U.S. At the by, was coined by uh, doctors in the veteran administrations, and it was diagnosed on Puerto Rican soldiers, mostly coming from the Korean War, and happened to be, when I look at the description, a, an literal repetition of the most classical form of hysteria, the one with which Freud discover the unconscious and invented psychoanalysis. I thought that that type of hysteria was something of the past, relegated to all psychiatric manuals. But when I was working in the barrio and I would see patients diagnosed with Puerto Rican syndrome, a name that already make us think of something that is at the same time uh, political, but also that can function as an allegory of a social situation that each person suffering what uh, in the local community without this very racist label because the, the invention of the Puerto Rican syndrome, it is a, a gesture, a segregating gesture of the psychiatric establishment that is still uh, active today. When you look at the Bible of diagnosis, the DSM, you will find Ataque de Nervios, or this ner attack of nerves, also known as the Puerto Rican syndrome. And it was only diagnosed for Puerto Ricans who are not an independent nation and live still today in a semi-colonial position facing the United States. So that already, I, there I realized that hysteria was an important tool uh, for political reading. Also, clinically, I felt that the best way of approaching those diagnosed with the Puerto Rican syndrome or with attack of the nervous was thinking in terms of what had been thought in the Freudian Lacanian field as hysteria, as a structure, a psychic structure in form of neurosis, so-called normal form of a psychic structuring, but also taken in this extended way, like Lacan does, as a form of social link. And for Lacan, it's a very important one because it's the definition of the speaking subject. And anyone who goes into analysis gets hystericized by the fact that somebody would then start posing questions about their own desire. This model of hysteria felt to me much more useful clinically mm. for uh, the, uh, how to listen to transidentify analysis that had historically in classic psychoanalysis, in Lacanian psychoanalysis, been highly pathologized and any non-normative expression of gender and sexuality, and in particular, any trans expression has been considered a sign of psychosis, which in my clinical experience is not the case. There are indeed some trans-identify analysis who may correspond to structure of psychosis, but many more are better, uh, I think, uh, thought you could think of their psychic structure in using the model of hysteria. I find it more productive in terms of the clinical practice. It's interesting that you were noting uh, these um, uh, two mistakes of Freud that in a way betray a little about his being subjected himself to the castration complex by misunderstanding what he calls castration the cutting off of the penis. Anyone who has been in a farm or anyone who knows about veterinarian practices knows that castration is 
uh, is not cut in the penis, but the testicles in the male, that what he's referring to is called more technically aberration, that already Freud is operating in a sort of mythical or projecting a fantasy, we could say, that already we see that he's under the spell of the castration complex. And I think, as you said, Alfie, what Lacan does is that if there is a potential for misreading of, of Freud by confusing the phallus with a bodily organ, for Lacan is clearly simply a signifier. So anything can be a phallus. A red Ferrari, a trophy wife. Yeah. They, we were saying that maybe now the new phallus is no longer maybe uh, between the legs. It could be higher up and it could be the six pack abdomen, very <laughs> body built. And that may be the new phallus being very muscular and toned, so that we see that indeed it's a signifier that could be filled with any meaning. So mm -hmm. I to, to answer this idea that I find a hysteria is a much more uh, productive clinical tool to think of a, a trans expressions, and, and that's what I encountered in the clinical practice. And, and, and we are talking about diagnosis, and maybe we need to say that in any case, from a Freudian Lacanian perspective, a diagnosis is a working hypothesis that you may or may not confirm with the clinical material, but that an analyst needs to have a, a hypothesis in mind to know where to direct the cure. This you you right. you're, you're directing the treatment. So if you're thinking you're working with somebody with a psychotic structure, you will intervene. Your technique will be different than if you are. Uh, working with someone you think is within a neurotic structure. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, a, it's a clinical concern that unhappily, and this is something I take distance from, has been used as a form of marginalizing people, that someone who did not fit into a certain construction of normalcy was considered somebody with a severe pathology, when in fact, I think those kind of uh, attitudes say more of those diagnosing than they say more of mm. those who are being diagnosed, that it becomes a symptom of the psychiatrist or the psychoanalyst who is uh, labeled in any, any non-normative expression as a, a severe pathology. And in that sense, there is a point of contact uh, working in the barrio with the uh, uh, mostly was a, at the time mostly Puerto Rican population and working with transidentify analysis that I was able thanks to the, the the lack we have as clinicians of being exposed to many things the, I always say the couch is like a window through which you can frame society five or ten years before you read about it in essays on on the news so we have this anticipation of social uh, manifestations, social phenomena, through the constrained individual setting of the window, that at times the window of the couch works as a, the window of a train in motion, and when it goes too fast, you just see lines of colors. You cannot really discern what you're seeing, and at times it goes a little slow, more slower, and then you can figure out what you're seeing. But that, uh, in a way, I, I was able to, to hear what it is like to uh, live your subjectivity when society ascribes to you a marginalized position, be it by race, by class, by gender, by sexuality. And, and how important uh, an analytic intervention uh, being, because the treatment in a way is led by the speech of the analysis, the fact that a person who for different reasons is uh, marginalized, to be treated as a grammatical subject could have such uh, an important emancipatory potential. Yeah. I mean, it's extremely interesting to think about these two things together in a, in a sense. Uh, the Barrios subjects primarily, presumably, uh, marginalized, as you put it, through race and class, um, and then the transgender analyzers through um, sexual or gender um, identity. And, and it's interesting to sort of hear the connections there. And, and it's also fascinating that you, you sort of think that uh, in the clinic, you see the clues to the 
social life to come. And, 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 and Absolutely, and, you see the future, the future. I was yeah. going to say but, dreams. So now we're back to dreams predict the future. Now yeah, yeah, I don't want to be too young. I don't want to be too young. Uh, but, but in a way, I think this is uh, the precisely because if in dreams begins responsibility, as Yates said, that there is an ethics in that you can find in dream life. Not only dreams yeah. is the royal path to the unconscious. In dreams, a space of futurity opens up. Yes. That uh, yes. Yeah, no, I think it's a great point. And I was just going to say add that it's, it's it's how you start the book, really, with uh, with the, the Transgender Psychoanalysis book, because you talk about when you did the first project, uh, which is called Select Your Gender. It was before the kind of Caitlyn Jenner moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just occurs to me this would be a good opportunity to talk about, um, I don't know, uh, cultural attitudes in the broader sphere towards trans individuals today, because you, what you're what what you just said is it matches exactly here you know you saw these patterns these ideas emerging then five or six years later there's what you call this kind of moment trans moments uh mm -hmm. where you know there's a kind of absolutely you know huge huge uh discussion around this you can barely uh you know pass a day without transgender related events on the news debates controversies and so on so mm -hmm. you know what what i guess i want to know what you make of the so-called, I mean, Elliot put it also well, like so-called debates, uh, so-called controversies that, that guide how transgender subjects are treated. And, and what is your, what, what, what is the alternative to, to this? I mean, that it, presumably you would advocate a, for, I don't, I don't know. I mean, why do you, what do you think this mm -hmm. moment is, is mm -hmm. getting wrong when it comes to these, these discussions, I guess? Yeah, I think that the trans experience continues to be the new civil rights frontier. Even uh, it, what made you, while I was writing the book, it took me, in a way, it made the writing of the book much longer than expected because I would break, wake up in the morning, get my coffee, open the newspaper, and every single day there was a trans-related piece of news. And that, that hasn't stopped. They, they would say the peak around the, I would say, 2010, but it has continued. Yesterday morning, in the front cover of the New York Times, there was, again, and, and, and the political climate, of course, has changed. Now, uh, many, uh, I was talking about mostly in Florida, that many people who had uh, felt that trans rights were going to be protected, all those uh, accomplishments and uh, advancements seem to have, been taken a few steps backward because what the, the article was talking about is that um, many people now don't have the, and the the right to have surgery before age 18, which was a right that they could have access to before. But what I think one confirms is that the trans body, if we think about uh, bodies uh, as uh, carriers of truth, because I think that's the main thing we should keep in mind, if there is one thing that psychoanalysis aims at, and that's what, psych where the emancipatory power of psychoanalysis lies, is, is a disclosure of a truth, a subjective truth that one didn't know and was alienated to from, and also a production of knowledge. You were mentioning, Alfie, about Freud making mistakes, but what was amazing about Freud is that he, he learned from the mistakes. He was able to learn from his mistakes and also that he was extremely generous. Many of Freud's cases that he left to us to learn from were, were failed cases and he had no shame, no, I think in a way he went beyond mm. any possible egoistic or narcissistic uh, objections and he shared that with us for future generations to learn again and open into the future. But I think that what we see uh, still that the trans body is a cultural barometer where you see still debates about uh, different political positions and different ideas about who should police uh, the body. It should be the state, should be the individual, should be the medical power. Uh, yeah. And uh, there, hysteria is always a wonderful uh, 
ally of uh, maybe social justice because you will there is a, a tendency in, in the I'm talking here about hysteria as a form of discourse, not strictly a, a psychic structure, always will produce knowledge. Uh, maybe we may say it's very eroticized knowledge because there's a, there's a big investment in producing knowledge and. That's how Freud was able to produce out of mistakes and that we may learn things. And happily in American society, we're saying, Alfie, how uh, the public eye presents the trans experience is often uh, reduced to a consumeristic lifestyle choice. You move to the suburbs, you stop smoking, you change genders. And this is exactly what the trans experience is not, and this is what I hear from in my office, from my analysis, and it's also what you may read. And, and uh, here I, I will uh, quote um, Jennifer Boylan, who says that it is not a lifestyle in the same way that a, being a woman or being a man would be a lifestyle. It's not a lifestyle choice. It's often this is, I think, that often what happens in, in the American context, I'm talking about the US, that uh, all these experiences tend to be uh, maybe reduced and uh, over or distorted as a simply a consumeristic choice, as if a, a gender would be just another commodity, and if you can afford it, you can modify it. What it sounds I, like it's a symptom, right? In terms of absolutely, there's a big difference see, between a, a choice and a symptom, and even calling it a symptom could have this liberatory aspect. It's like, well, actually, there is a non-equivalence between your choosing to move to the suburbs and trans identity, right? Mm -hmm. That's That sounds a bit subtle for uh, the US. <laughs> like, that would be like, I think I think you made a good point, which is this is this is the challenge of, you know, there's, I think there's a big attack on subtlety on the possibilities of uh, politics of desire, uh, when, especially when you see the far right, not just in the US or Sweden, but now, now in Italy as well, and you hear like, mm -hmm. what are they saying? They're not saying produce new knowledge. They're saying we know what the family is and what how everything it should be, and it's man and woman. And this that's it, right? Um, what what do you make of this kind? Of, it almost seems like a neurosis, like to like the 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 foreclosure of these like symptoms is its own kind of neurosis. I, I mean, yeah, I don't know I, I think what, you're what optimistic. You just, yeah. I'm, I'm happily certain. I'm you optimistic. Were talking, <laughs> you're, you're, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm a little scared <laughs> of the world situation and well, the kind of leaders people are are choosing makes you aware that uh, true democracy is a very pre, pre, yeah very precarious. I cannot even pronounce the word. That's how scared I am. <laughs> that it reminds me of the Rida who says that democracy is to come. It's, Maybe not yet there, hopefully. But uh, and happily, I think what you are referring to, if, if a political discourse says this is what a family is, this is what good values, and this is, uh, and, and we know these are all constructions that are uh, historically flawed, but it's more on the side of psychosis where uh, there mm. is always certainty. Things are the way they are, and this is how things should be, and we will make them great again, and we will get rid of right. immigrants, and we will, and things will be perfect, and there will be no space for uncertainty, mm, reinvention, questioning, evolution. Things are this way. Why is Sounds psychosis me, certain? Because there is no space for ambivalence and, and metaphor. In fact, there is no metaphor. Things are that in a way, uh, in this, uh, and that doesn't make life uh, easier. It's seemingly when you when you do when you have all the answers, there is no room for questions. So you are in your home and you hear and now it's on the wall. So you assume it's your neighbor making noise because your neighbor hates you and wants you to interrupt you as you're trying to finish reading your favorite novel. So right. there is a sort of system of thinking where there is no space for doubt, uh, gray areas, what it is. is, And at times uh, reactionary discourses are very seductive because 
they they not only they they tell you not only what to think they tell you not to think so that's mm. at times for some people that may give a sense of reassurance i mean yeah i think that's, that's really i mean one like existing tension in my head and, and you know this is probably my own failure to think it through I, I feel like there's a tension between on the one hand um the, a term like queer or universal, which are both part of your um, discussions in this book, which are, are both geared towards la largely through, you know, queer theory and so on, and an, an idea of psychoanalysis as something which searches for the universal, uh, as well as the, mm -hmm. that really interesting we said earlier, the individual in particular. But, but um, or, or these things seem all inclusive, whereas the kind of identity identity category of tr a transgender person. You know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, is is um, more exclusive. It's is applying. It applies to someone and not to someone else, right? So we have cis cis men and trans women, or whatever. You know, and I wonder whether that this is do, is this a is there a tension here of some kind between one which is one drive to see us all as queer. You know, in the sense this is something from queer theory. We're we're all queer. We're all uh, universally experiencing lack, for example, if we want to. Mm -hmm. So, but then on the other hand, there's a desire to categorize people into kind of identity categories. And, and could trans not be one of such categories when aren't we all trans in a sense, uh, in the sense that we're all queer, if, if sexuality functions in this way? Or is yeah, there... and, yeah, I, you're pointing to something very important. Indeed, in the same way that we are all queer or not that in a way, the manner in which Freud thinks of the drive, it's a drive that is essentially queer because the sexual drive has no object other than satisfaction. And the object of the drive is totally contingent, could be anything. It doesn't matter. And it's not gender, the object of the drive. So uh, in that sense, any human being has a sexual constitution that is by definition queer, polymorphous. Perverse without any moral way, that we could read that way Freud, a sort of pink Freud. On the other hand, indeed, there is, I think, this That's tension Freud. that there is something unique about uh, how uh, each person would find a, a way of uh, living their body, assume their bodily, mortal, sex, gender ex existence. For me, it's helpful to use the notion of Lacan when he talks about the saint is the later Lacan, he uses this uh, archaic spelling of the word symptom to denote a symptom that is not like the medical symptom. It's nothing to cure, it's not to be eliminated. It's a symptom that he spells S-I-T-H-O-M-E, symptom, that allows someone to exist, to be, is their own, their own way they figure out how to make do with life. And that's unique. And that's uh, something that you cannot, because I, I think what is revolutionary in the position of psychoanalysis, if I may say so, is that it resists a tailorization, a standardization. It cannot be created in an assembly line. Subjectivity is the wrench thrown into the assembly line. But that there is something in the Santom that would work for this person in particular in this specific situation. And that any form of embodiment, be cis, be trans, any form of a gender positioning, male, female, or anything else in between, inside the binary, outside the binary, are all unique uh, creative acts that any assumption of our um, Mm. bodily existence requires an element of uh, art in the sense of a, a craft like an yeah. artisan the know-how more than uh, high arts w also what I, I agree with you that there is this uh, uh, tension inherent in psychoanalysis between a, a certain universalism that is dangerous because it could hide colonialist uh, and imperialist realities and, uh, and a, a position of otherness that defines psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis will only continue being psychoanalysis and operate from a position of marginality, of other 
witness. So there is always this tension. And this tension has been, for instance, exploited by Fanon, who used the work of Lacan, or even thinkers in Afro-pessimism, that there is something in psychoanalytic discourse that maintains this uh, position of otherness and is aware of this tension. Mm. So, I mean, if I got, I've understood it right, that you, you're sort of saying that categories like trans or cis, cis are, they're not, they're, they're necessary as a kind of knowledge formation rather than, I guess I was thinking that they're, they're, they're divisive. They, they split a population into, into two different categories, which, which when, it, when we should see it as sort of universal in the sense that we're all queer kind of thing. But yeah, it, we, yeah, 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 that in a way, if you want to be very uh, clear, the transsexual doesn't exist in the same way that Lacan yeah. says the woman does not exist. Yeah, so, that's, that's more liberatory for, yeah, yeah. But the category you think is still necessary to produce the this kind of... We could take the, as Elliot was saying, as a symptom, yeah. a symptom that for some could work like a symptom. So we move from a symptom as something that could alienate you, that could bring you to talk to an analyst, that could make you take pills or do a lot of yoga or be awake at night where you want to sleep, or could be a symptom, which is a creative act that could be completely uh, singular and, and from somebody looking from the outside a little arbitrary and absurd, but allows you to enjoy your unconscious and yeah. your life becomes livable. And what I noted is that there was something of this a creative gesture in any uh, assumption, on any, uh, any act of embodiment, that the body and the, the, in a way, the alignment between a gender and an identity is the result of identification. A lot has been done in psychoanalysis about identity, identification, but that the truth of the subject emerges precisely when identity fails. And there is, I, I cannot agree more with you, Alfie, this tension in psychoanalysis all the time, but it's in this crossroads that the subject emerges. The yeah. subject is traversed and, and created by society, but emerges in when something of that subject contradicts the social discourse or the social mandate, or reinterpret them. Maybe we could put it this way, that any assumption of subjectivity is, is a unique interpretation of uh, discourses, social mandates, uh, family over determinations. What a psychoanalysis often, when it works, when it's completed an analysis, that person will be able to take some distance, will take some distance from this, what we may call in Lacanian terminology, the big other. You can, you can find the space. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's really great. Um, a great way of thinking about it. Uh, any last things, Elliot, before we... No, because no. I feel like I could, I could ask, uh, I could ask things, and we could, we could probably talk for another hour about, yeah, exactly. uh, what is the significance of creating the other as the object, and what does it mean to understand the other as a subject? Yeah. This is like, I feel like this for me is the unresolved kind of maybe. <laughs> we're, we're, we're past time, but maybe, yeah. maybe quickly, maybe quickly we could touch on this. I don't know. I don't um, think we can. It's, it's, no, it's, no, it's, no. it's a very good question. How? Yeah, yeah. How? Because we relate. We relate. We we not only relate to others as, as objects or not even objects, partial objects. We yeah. are partial objects for yeah. the other. And on top of that, to complicate matters, we never know what. Uh, am I for the other or what the other is for me? Right. So that's the, 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 the unconscious in a way disrupts and, and we were talking about producing knowledge uh, trying to uh, recapture is that we, we Lacan says that one of our main, we have, he only lists three passions, passion for ignorance, we love love for knowledge, passion for ignorance. We uh, it talks about passion, love, love, hate, and ignorance. We are always going to ignore what, what we are for the other, what the other is, 
And, and not only that, it will be always in a fragmented way that we will be. The intersubjective relationship is always fragmentary. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really, really interesting. We could, of course, talk for a long time, but I think I think we've got, got somewhere at least with thinking about why and like psychoanalysis and transgender go together and then to connect that to, to, to class and race through the barriers has been extremely interesting. And I just really recommend uh, Patricia's fantastic books. We'll also put the links in the uh, little whatever that thing is called that I can never remember the name of. But, you know, really the recommend. The details, they're where the devil is. Yeah, the details, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, thanks so much uh, for listening, everyone. And thanks so much for joining us, Patricia. It's been extremely interesting to talk to you and, and really kind of uh, loads to think about. So thank you so much for coming on and doing this. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your questions. And we could continue another time, hopefully in person. It would be nice. Yeah, that would be nice. That would be nice. Okay, then. Goodbye. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thank you.